again <laughs> at an interesting time in your political story. Um, this is the deepest image we currently have uh, taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. It's the ultra deep field. It's a few years old now. Uh, it's a very small area of sky, a few arc minutes across, and the objects that you see uh, marked here uh, are their photometric redshifts. These are objects beyond a redshift of, of eight or so, seen when the universe was only a few hundred million years old. It's a very exciting time in this topic because we are approaching the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope in a couple of years' time. And so we're beginning to think about how to use that facility uh, to study the very earliest galaxies. And so I what I want to talk, talk to you today is the progress that we've been making. We are learning that the reionization era uh, seems to be intimately connected with the formation of the very first galaxies. And so connecting these two uh, possibilities is going to be uh, very, very exciting observationally. So uh, I usually start with this very nice Scientific American cartoon from Avi Loeb, which illustrates uh, for non-expert uh, what this subject is about. So here's the microwave background. Time is running from left to right. Uh, the hydrogen atom, of course, forms after recombination. And we see uh, that, that hydrogen, those hydrogen clouds are clumped under gravity through the uh, dark matter that has fractionated out of the expansion uh, at earlier times. And the clumping of hydrogen eventually leads to overdensities which collapse and cool radiatively and they ignite stellar nuclear fusion in, in the cores of these very early stellar systems. These stars do not have heavy elements. They uh, only contain hydrogen and helium. And so per unit mass, they're much hotter than the stars that we see in the Milky Way. So they have copious amounts of ultraviolet photons. Those photons uh, are capable of photoionizing uh, regions around them. The presumably, as time progresses, these ionized bubbles enlarge. More and more systems collapse. The ionized bubbles overlap. And the universe transitions from this uh, neutral medium to uh, an ionized medium. And so the, you know, in this picture, the two are very clearly connected. The very earliest objects uh, produce the onset of this cosmic reionization. And I think the exciting thing is that we're, we're now observing galaxies in what we think is this reionization era. And uh, as an old man, I like this slide very much because it encapsulates uh, the history over my involvement in astronomy from when I was an undergraduate. Uh, when the most distant galaxy was a, a mere redshift of 0.5 or so, and quasars had just been discovered. Uh, and then you can see for many years, during the 70s and 80s, uh, quasars were the most distant known objects in the universe. And only really with the onset of the Keck telescope, uh, and Chuck Steidel and his group and others uh, finally managed to find star-forming galaxies at redshifts of five and so. And then along came these gamma ray bursts, very exciting objects, extraordinarily luminous, of course, difficult to, to follow up quickly. Uh, and they have pushed out to redshifts of eight. Uh, quasars now more or less flattened out at a redshift of seven, where stock value is no longer so exciting, uh, and galaxies. And uh, hopefully, we continue to search for gamma ray bursts. So this period is now observationally accessible. That's the main uh, point of this slide. So, you know, how would we find, you know, the holy grail in this is, you know, the very first objects, the f what we would call the very first generation of galaxies. And, uh, you know, it's been a dream for many years that we would find these by finding pristine objects, objects uh, devoid of chemical elements heavier than uh, helium and lithium, uh, which would be an indication that they were pristine. And, you know, if you go back and look at um, the case for James Webb Space Telescope, then measuring the composition uh, of these early objects uh, is one of the main goals uh, of, uh, anticipated for that mission. Well, it turns out that I think this approach is not going to be observationally feasible if we believe our theoretical colleagues. And the answer is that simulations suggest that these very early halos, 
which have maybe masses of 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8 solar masses, are very, very quickly self-polluted by the very first supernovae. So if you take a type 2 supernova, it has a metal yield of something like the most massive ones would be something like 15 solar masses of, of metals. And within a very sp short space of time, tens of millions of years, these halos will be enriched uh, with heavy elements uh, so that this idea of searching for a very short period when the objects are still pristine is observationally going to be very, very challenging. They'll be extremely rare. And, you know, this was first pointed out by... Um, John Wise, who I think he, he, was, uh, he was here at Princeton, I seem to remember, uh, and now most recently in this very nice simulation uh, of a supernova exploding in an early mini halo uh, by, by uh, Britton Smith. So it seems to me that a much more practical way of identifying the very first objects is to tie them to reionization, and that has a number of advantages. It's a statistical uh, whoops, it's a statistical measurement rather than looking for some, you know, unusual object with low or zero metal content. Uh, and so tying the first galaxies to the physical onset of reionization uh, is what I want to talk to, to you about today. But it does have some limitations. It means we have to understand uh, the key role of galaxies in reionization, and we have to try to determine uh, when this happened. And um, as you probably heard, I'm, you know, in, I've only recently just moved, so I have both uh, U.S. collaborators that I'll refer to, but particularly Brant Robertson at Santa Cruz, Dan Stark at Arizona, Tucker Jones at Davis, and Grupa uh, in, in Europe, Jim Dunlop at Edinburgh, and my emerging group uh, in, uh, at UCL. So um, the biggest news in this area over the last 12 months is the Planck paper, um, which indicates that re reionization was late in terms of time and fast. And so the idea here is that the polarization uh, probes the foreground electrons. So think of the universe ionized today and a column of electrons all the way back to the beginning of reionization, shown schematically uh, here. Um, then the optical depth of this scattering, the so-called tau, uh, constrains the mean redshift when reionization occurred. And uh, most recently, uh, with some uncertainty, I think, which we may discuss, uh, the duration of reionization. So this figure of tau, which is an optical depth, um, has come down over the years and is now at its lowest value, 0.058. And in the Planck paper, you can see various parametric models uh, depending on whether it's symmetric or asymmetric, uh, for, the, for the progress of the fraction of the universe that's ionized. And you can see that, broadly speaking, they all lie within this very narrow redshift range, just a few hundred million years, starting at a redshift of 10 or so and ending at a redshift of 6. And um, if you look at the Planck paper in detail, it's really quite... Uh, aggressive, actually. Um, firstly, uh, they do a, uh, an analysis of the redshift of the beginning of reionization, uh, and that's shown uh, here. And they get a, a value of about 10 plus or minus 2. Uh, and then they get a measurement of the end of reionization, which is, is uh, pretty, pretty un not co uncontroversial, I would say, around a redshift of 6 or so. But they specifically say that less than 10% of the reionization history uh, goes beyond a redshift of 10. Now, you have to put this in context. When James Webb was first proposed, and you know, we started thinking about this, uh, Tau was very much larger. There was the idea that galaxies extended out to redshifts of 20, maybe 30. And James Webb would have a very hard time looking at galaxies beyond, say, a redshift of 15 or so. So if the Planck result is correct, this shifting down of the reionization era makes it much more observationally practical uh, to understand their role in reionization and to even begin to assign populations to the very first uh, uh, stellar systems. So um, 
Planck, uh, if it's correct, uh, tells us that reionization maybe began at redshifts of 10 to 12 or so, but there's rich astrophysics that tells us that reionization ended at six. And you know, this is such a, uh, an interesting field. There's now a book by Andre Messinger, you can, you can get hold of it, Understanding the Epoch of Reionization, and there are many nice review chapters here um, that verify independently through studies of the intergalactic medium. So I'll just talk briefly about some of these, uh, the Gunn-Peterson and proximity zone tests of quasars, Lyman alpha scattering through studies of galaxies, uh, and soon we will have 21 centimeter tomography of the neutral uh, gas in the intergalactic medium as well. And these collectively do support the idea uh, that reionization ended at six. So the only um, you know, uncertainty really, I would say, is the Planck result that tells us uh, that reionization began at redshift of, of 10 to 12 or so. So let's just go through some of these arguments that reionization ended at six. Here's how quasars and, and gamma ray bursts work. I'm sure you're familiar with this. You have a luminous object. It's essentially being used as a beacon. You get a spectrum. Here's the spectrum of Lyman alpha in the quasar. Uh, there are two broad techniques. One is the opacity of neutral absorption along the line of sight, so-called Lyman alpha forest. It's also a Gunn-Peterson effect. And then the influence of the quasar on its immediate surroundings, which is called the near zone or proximity test. Uh, the radiation from the quasar is interacting with the gas in, in its immediate vicinity, and that's telling us something about its uh, neutrality uh, and, um, and the UV background. So here's some uh, real data. Here's a gamma ray burst of a redshift of six. You see very, very nicely the Gunn-Peterson effect. Here's the most distant quasar, redshift of 7.1. And here one's interested in the near zone and the, the rapidity of the fall off of the signal. And that's a little bit difficult to see here. But here's the redshift 7 quasar. And you can see in front of the quasar, uh, the signal falls off very rapidly. Whereas at these two quasars at lower redshift, it's falling off uh, less steeply. So these effects. Um, can be used to measure the opacity of abs hydrogen absorption in Lyman alpha, the so-called Gunn-Peterson opacity, as a function of redshift. And you know, the, it's showing that beyond a redshift of five or so, it starts to rise up quite steeply. Uh, and this, you know, there's been some discussion of the scatter on this uh, recently. But broadly speaking, it's telling us that reionization, something interesting is happening at redshift six. It's not a, you know, following this through, I would say that it's not, a, the subject in this area has not advanced a lot in the last, say, five years or so for two reasons. One, you know, this still is the most distant uh, quasar, redshift seven. There's, a, there's, you know, large numbers of quasars between six and seven, but there's very little data beyond that. And secondly, it's not very sensitive. Only a small amount of neutral gas, one part in a thousand per unit volume, saturates, uh, you know, completely extinguishes the signal from the background source. So it's not as if one, you know, the dynamic range of this test uh, is, not very, is not very useful. Nonetheless, it does confirm that something interesting is happening at redshift six. Equally, um, completely independently and equally um, limiting in its, in its usefulness, but I think it, does, it has helped, is Lyman alpha emission in galaxies. So the Lyman alpha line, of course, is the most prominent line in star forming galaxies, especially at low metallicities. As much as 7% of the light of a galaxy comes out in one spectrum line. So for an observer like myself, that's very exciting because it's very easy with a spectrograph to detect. But it is a resonant line. And so uh, if the line, is, so it's easily scattered by neutral gas. So if the, um, the star forming galaxy is in the neutral era, then the Lyman alpha photon, although produced, uh, does not get very far in the circling galactic medium around the galaxy. It's easily scattered uh, and extinguished. But if the line, if the galaxy is sitting in one of those avi low ionized bubbles, then the Lyman alpha photon travels unimpeded through the ionized region, 
And by the time it gets to the edge of the ionized region, it's Doppler shifted out of resonance by the expansion of the universe. Now, there are many other ways of eliminating Lyman alpha, and we'll discuss these very briefly. Uh, but this idea goes back to Jordi Miralda Escude uh, when he was in Cambridge, um, and uh, Mike Santos and various others. So uh, my colleagues and I, when, this is a, when I was at Caltech, my students and I, um, Dan Stark, who's now at Arizona, uh, Matt Schenker, who's now earning considerably more in Manhattan, um, did this redshift survey um, of color-selected galaxies. So well now we're looking at the fraction of galaxies selected by color that show this Lyman alpha line. And sure enough, uh, you know, here's an example. Here are some examples. Here's a galaxy at 26 magnitude, very, very prominent Lyman alpha line. Here's a weaker one, uh, and here are some ne negative spectra. So that what you're seeing here is the, the black is the Lyman alpha with its redshift shown, and these horrible stripes are the night sky lines, of course, which are really always a, a nuisance in this kind of faint object work. So what we found, um, this is really, well, it was uh, Schenker's thesis, basically, was uh, that the fraction of sources with Lyman alpha is indeed high. Um, there may be an evolutionary trend, but it's something like 50% of the L-star galaxies at redshift 6 are showing this line. Yes, so there's an equivalent width limit, which is not, so there's, you know, down to some rest frame equivalent width limit um, in a given UV luminosity range. So the galaxies are color selected, and then they're broken into their luminosities. And then at each redshift, the fraction of objects which have a, a strength in Lyman alpha that is above a certain equivalent width limit is then the fraction of objects that's plotted in this, uh, in this figure. So you can see that there's two trends here. One is luminous objects. Uh, are generally less, have le the fraction is lower, and as you go to fainter objects, uh, the fraction of objects is higher. But the trend in both is that it seems to rise and then fall precipitously beyond a redshift of six or so. I'm coming to that, yeah. So I'm going to come to that. Um, so, you know, this result, which this is a very short period of time, of course, so it would require rather a coordinated uh, evolution in the galaxies themselves for them to be so nicely orchestrating that their, that their uh, fraction is, is falling. Uh, and so the, you know, the interpretation of this is that it's the increased uh, amount of neutral gas in the regions uh, around these galaxies that's leading to this loss. And the, the, the observational data that we published uh, is based on about 80 galaxies in total beyond a redshift of six, and subsequently uh, other groups have uh, confirmed this result. But now let me come to some of the uncertainties in this, uh, which I think may help answer your question, Meta. Um, as, as with the quasars, this has been a useful experiment to determine that the galaxy, you know, beyond a redshift of six, uh, probably the explanation for this drop is due to uh, increased neutral gas in the intergalactic medium. But as a quantitative tool, uh, it's turned out to be very difficult to interpret. So uh, various groups, whoops, I keep pressing the wrong button here. Various groups uh, have attempted to interpret our data in terms of uh, what one might call uh, the change in the neutral fraction. And they find that in a space of only 200 million years, uh, the neutral fraction goes from being about zero up to being about 30 to 50 percent. And when we lived in a WMAP period of tau, where tau was very high, everybody was uncomfortable with this. Uh, but now, if Planck is right, and it's a very fast reionization, it's not so challenging. Nonetheless, there are, there are some big uncertainties. Firstly, you know, the measurement is a fraction of objects which show a spectrum line. If the line is not there, it is assumed that it's been occulted by neutral gas. But it could be that that galaxy is simply not at that redshift. Uh, and um, so this means that, you know, we have to make an estimate of the contamination 
Uh, now, to, to explain the entire result as being uh, foreground objects, uh, I think everybody agrees we can rule out because the, the fraction of foreground objects would be extraordinarily high. Secondly, if you look at simulations, reionization is a very patchy process. We wouldn't expect, um, you know, in, in, in the small fields where these spectrographs operate, that we would, with only 100 objects, get a very accurate uh, measurement of the actual decline rate. All we would say is it seems likely that something interesting is happening. And then finally, um, the, the, to convert uh, this drop into a neutral fraction, uh, you have to assume the velocity offset of Lyman alpha from what we call the systemic redshift of the galaxy. And that means you need another emission line. You know, if you want to measure the, where Lyman alpha is offset from the r true redshift of the galaxy, you need, a, uh, you need spectra with two lines. And um, that's slowly becoming available. There are about you know, a handful of objects now beyond a redshift seven where we have seen the other lines, and I'll show you those in a moment. And there's some evidence that this offset is not a constant, it's changing. And that reduces this rapidity. So th all of these uncertainties mean that this technique, just like the quasar technique, is useful for telling us that reionization ended at redshift six, but it's not a quantitative tool that we can use to track the evolution of a neutral fraction. So yeah, so this is a simulation uh, that shows that, you know, if you have a sight line, so this is very complicated, I'm sorry, but this width here is like the field of view of, uh, say, a spectrograph on the Keck telescope. So you could choose areas where, you know, over the redshift range where we're probing, you would not see this trend, and then there are other areas where, you know, it's fully, uh, fully, fully ionized. So the patchiness means that one would have to do a very large survey to get a representative result, and I think that's unlikely with the current facilities. Uh, so before I conclude this bit about the end of reionization, since I'm in Princeton and I know there's a lot of excitement with the hypersupine camera, uh, with the first results coming in, then you know there is an alternative probe, and that uses the Lyman alpha line, but instead of charting the fraction, you look at their spatial distribution. So if you imagine um, those ionized bubbles in the Avi Loeb picture, then one would like to see the evolution of the number and sizes of those bubbles. And of course, the Lyman alpha emitters that are seen with narrowband images over this very large area in a survey about 25 square degrees will chart the c correlation function of these uh, Lyman alpha emitters. Unfortunately, with narrowband filters, you know, you don't have a continuous wavelength coverage. You select in you know, discrete redshifts. So they will be able to do this uh, from a redshift of 6.6 .6 up to seven or so. And you know, that is a very interesting time uh, in the reionization history. So you know, this is gonna come very, very soon. And of course also the radio data, which I'm not, I'm not gonna talk about. So let me turn to the next part, which is you know, that we are observing galaxies in this period. I mean, let's assume that the Planck result is correct end of reionization, since we have several independent measures that reionization ended at six, began at 10 or 11. What are we doing about looking in this region to see whether firstly there really are enough galaxies to do the job? And um, of course, Hubble has been leading the way here um, in photometry. So I showed you the ultra deep field. This is 2012. It was the first glimpse beyond a redshift of eight. Now we had the candle survey, which is a slightly shallower but wider area data um, with IRAC coverage, which I'll come to. Um, and collectively from these deep surveys, we now have about 200 galaxies uh, in what the putative reionization era. And uh, complementing that are the frontier fields, so uh, gravitational lensing is being used to look at subluminous objects which are boosted by foreground clusters. Uh, of course, you have to understand the mass model and the magnification characteristics, which is always a challenge, but these, this is exquisite data uh, taken in many filters of, and large numbers of teams have independently been comparing their mass models. So they've been very healthy for the 
subject of strong gravitational lensing. And the good news is that these two techniques, which are very different, you know, black fields, long exposures, uh, clusters that magnify the background universe, uh, more or less give the same result. And um, what you see here is uh, the famous Nadal curve, but now, of course, we're focusing on the rate of decline of the number of galaxies and their UV uh, surf uh, surface density, volume density, down to some uh, luminosity limit as a function of redshift from, say, 6 out to a redshift of 10. And you can see this decline. It was first you know, we first did with the ultra-deep field, recently updated here from the frontier field data from uh, Derek McLeod. And as, you know, there's been a lot of interest in, in this, this slope, uh, which I, I could spend a few minutes talking about, but I'll just say that, you know, there was a lot of excitement a few years ago because it was claimed that this decline suddenly became much steeper. It went uh, as one plus redshift to the minus three here, and then steepen to 1 plus redshift to the minus 10. And there were big arguments within the observational community is this. It, it really doesn't look like uh, there's a sudden break at a redshift of 8 when this, this decline is, is pretty smooth. Uh, uh, the black is the new data that takes into account the frontier field and the blank fields. The blue points were earlier data from um, the group at Santa Cruz that suggested, uh, from based on smaller samples, that it was falling more steeply, and I think you know that's not no longer the case. That was on the this one is the ultra deep field only. This is all of the candles data, the ultra deep field, and all the black frontier fields. This is a huge amount of data. It's like 350 square arc minutes. This is like about five square arc minutes, something like that. Progress, <laughs> This is corrected. Um, so this is this part is taken from the review of Madow and Dickinson, and that's corrected for UV. Yeah, but it's c you probably looks unfamiliar because in you know it's usually all you see <laughs> is this bit here. Okay, so uh, what we've done is added the high redshift data to that. Well, the, da the data points are, these data points are directly, and um, I forget the distinction, I think the blue points are the UV selected objects and the, and the red points are uh, submit, you know, the, yeah, 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 and they agree. So in fact, in the Madow and Dickinson, they're plotted separately so you can see them. Okay, um, so where the lensing data, so I, I tried to tell you that these two techniques agree in the numbers of objects. Um, what the lensing data tells you um, is, of course, it probes much intri intrinsically fainter galaxies that are boosted. And that leads us to the luminosity function, which is, you know, a very important aspect of this story. You know, even with these amazingly deep exposures, we're not going to see all the galaxies, right? I mean, there's going to be a luminosity limit beyond which, even with this enormous uh, investment in observing time. And here it is for the UDF at a redshift of 8. So this, again, was Schenker and uh, others, McClure. So here's the luminosity function. So this is the volume density at redshift 8. And you can see we got down to about minus 17 in UV luminosity. And we found that the Schechter slope, at the faint end was incredibly steep. This has been known for some time, minus 1.9 or so. And the first frontier field data has been analyzed by ATEC. <laughs> and you can see that through the effect of boosting, in, you know, he's able to push the luminosity function about a magnitude and a little bit uh, fainter. And this slope is very, very important to understand. And uh, because it tells us the integrated luminosity density of the universe at this time. And uh, there are six of these clusters that are being observed. The, the program is still going on. Uh, and uh, Brant Robertson and I estimated that when the whole thing is done, if these first three clusters are representative, then at the end of the story, we will get the 
slope of this luminosity function pretty well nailed down so that the integrated luminosity density down to unobserved limits uh, will be known to about 30% or so. Now, you know, it depends obviously on how far down you integrate this thing. And so that's, that's a clearly an uncertainty. But let me explain now um, why galaxies could, uh, in principle, be the sole agents of reionization. So what we do now is we take uh, this abundance history and we just integrate, we just make some assumptions about how, how uh, they're ionizing, how much radiation comes out of a galaxy. Clearly that's a big uncertainty. And then we integrate the optical depth. So as a function of redshift, the optical depth of electrons rises up and then starts to flatten at a redshift of five. And the reason it does that is of course the numbers are falling so steeply here. And it just squeaked in with the first Planck results in 2015. And if you take this curve and predict the ionization history, uh, it looks like this. Now the, I'm gonna come to these questionable assumptions in a moment. But if I now put the Planck 2016 results, you can see, uh, you know, almost a prediction, really. I mean, it matches uh, really very, very nicely, okay? Uh, so the key thing now is validating these, validating these assumptions. What fraction, uh, you know, what is the ionizing spectrum of these early galaxies? What fraction of the photons that ionize can get out of the galaxy and so forth? And so that's where the subject has really started to become astrophysical. I think up until now it's just been demographics, you know, counting galaxies, looking at their luminosity functions, all familiar territory for galaxy evolution, of course. But now really we're looking at the, the ionization history. So it's really Saha's equation. We have an ionizing photon rate. It depends on the number of UV star-forming galaxies. Uh, it depends on the nature of the stellar populations in those galaxies. That tells us the ionizing spectrum, which is really the measurement of the, of the distribution of hot stars, whether there are AGN involved, for example. And then there's, of course, the galaxy has gas. It's forming stars, so there must be gas in it, so the photons have to get out of the galaxy. They're scattered, and only some fraction of these can escape. Nobody believes these numbers are constants, uh, but we, need, we seek some measurements that can at least constrain them uh, to address this, uh, these assumptions. And traditionally, uh, people looked at the ionizing um, spectrum in terms of a quantity called psi ion, which is the ratio, the number of uh, UV ionizing photons below the Lyman limit uh, per UV uh, luminosity. And the idea is that if the galaxy has a high, it has a steep ultraviolet continuum, maybe it has a lot of hot stars that are metal poor, then it has a, it's very prodigious uh, producer of ionizing photons with a large psi ion. Uh, whereas if it's metal rich and maybe dusty or whatever, has a flatter spectrum uh, and has a low ionizing uh, production rate. And so people began looking at the colors. And it turns out that the colors, these galaxies are, of course, extraordinarily blue. Um, the colors are measured with the UV slope in around about 1,500 angstroms. <coughs> and they do have a slope of about minus two. But you can see it depends, the interpretation in terms of the ionizing productivity just from this spot measurement of the color is just too uncertain. It depends on the IMF, it depends on the metallicity, it depends on whether there's any dust or so. So this has not been a very productive uh, way of estimating the ionizing productivity. And there's many reasons to worry about even our current understanding of stellar models, whether, these are, uh, whether we completely understand the main sequence at the very high end. So for example, there's a lot of interest in massive stars that are in binaries and whether this affects the ionizing productivity in two ways. Firstly, um, if st hot stars are in binaries, they may interact and that may increase their temperature. Uh, there may be mass transfer that rejuvenates them. They could stay on the main sequence uh, longer periods than we currently model. Uh, if they rotate, they could have longer main sequence lifetimes as well. 
And so various groups, um, Phil Hopkins and his student at Caltech, Elizabeth Stanway, have suggested that, you know, the classic stellar population tools that we use may underestimate these ionizing productivities by factors of several. Uh, and of course, so that means that just measuring the colors of galaxies is not really going to tell us a great deal of precision work. Um, so the other way you can look at the ionizing spectrum is through recombination physics. So the idea here is to look for the, the uh, recombination lines. Sadly, at Redshift 7, that of course shifted way out of ground-based spectrographs. Um, but uh, Spitzer, uh, of course, can detect lines from photometry. And uh, so this, I'll show an example of this in a moment. But so Richard Burns has looked at um, the Barmer lines uh, in redshift gal galaxies at redshifts of between 3.8 and 5. He, he took these from our, our survey, actually. And then looking at the strength of this, uh, of H alpha, and calculating uh, this ionizing parameter psi ion and getting, you know, typically it's uncertain to a factor of 50% uh, or so. Uh, so that's another, another way of, of looking at the, the, the ionizing spectrum. Um, and then the last way is to uh, look for these other high ionization lines. So Lyman alpha is not the only spectrum line in the, in the UV. There are other metal lines. Uh, and they have, some of them have very high ionization potentials. So they're a very useful probe of the ionizing spectrum that enables these lines to be seen. So just uh, th these lines are probably familiar, carbon-4, partially forbidden oxygen-3, partially forbidden carbon-3. And um, so tools are now being developed, and I think this is going to be very exciting with James Webb, to look for these spectrum lines. And of course, the ratio of these lines um, tells us, especially if you can look at the same species like carbon-4 and carbon-3, uh, tells you whether there's a metal pore contribution or even a non-thermal contribution. And I'll come to this. is going to be very important. We surely, if there's a quasar at redshift 7, it's reasonable to assume there are AGN in this era. And the AGN may make a contribution of photons uh, to uh, the reionization history. Yeah, so that needs, that needs to be constrained. Uh, some of these lines are doublets, and if you can measure the uh, doublet ratio, it constrains the, the electron density and temperature. So we've started looking for these lines. Uh, oh, I have a diversion. Let me just show you this uh, uh, very nice idea of using Spitzer. So all the galaxies I showed you so far were selected by this Lyman uh, break technique. So the idea is probably very familiar to you. You have Hubble photometry in the infrared. You have Hubble photometry in the optical. And there's this huge discontinuity. And the position of this continuity tells you that the galaxies are at redshift 7 and 8 and so forth. Spitzer, very modest telescope, but amazingly uh, productive, uh, measures photometry only. It doesn't have spectrographs any longer that are functional. Uh, and so it has a photometry at three and a half microns uh, and four and a half microns. And if you look at this spectral energy distribution, there's a sudden leap uh, at in this 4.5 micron signal. So uh, in the candles data, four objects, four luminous objects were found which have this very significant excess, which lies at the position of the oxygen three emission line. So the idea is that these galaxies have extraordinarily intense oxygen-3 emission, equivalent widths of thousands, a thousand angstroms or more in the rest frame. And they found four of these objects in the candles field. And we started looking at these spectroscopically. And lo and behold, we found they had very prominent Lyman alpha. So this is back to the game of redshift records. Pascal Osh looked at this object. So it's at 7.73, so its photometry suggested it was 7.9. Got a Lyman alpha at redshift 7.7. And then this object here, by Adi Zitrin and I, uh, photometrically 8.57, Lyman alpha at a redshift of 8.68. And uh, since then, we confirmed Lyman alpha in the other two. 
So there are four objects with this intense oxygen-3 emission, and they all show Lyman alpha. And, uh, you know, we, this seems surprising because, the, you know, if our story is correct, the neutral the, the medium should be pretty neutral at this time, especially at 8.68. You'd expect the IGM to be 60% neutral. So how can this be? Well, it could be that these objects are uh, a slight, because they're luminous and they show this intense line, it could be that they have unusually strong radiation fields. They've already uh, created ionized bubbles at an early time. Or conceivably, you know, they could have uh, AGN or unusual stellar populations. So these have been the first targets of ours in looking for these, um, these UV metal lines. And I'll show you where we've got to. It's very challenging work. Lyman alpha alone is pretty hard to see. So we started following these up. All this work is done at Keck with Mo the MOSFIRE near-infrared spectrograph. <coughs> and the first thing we did, and this was published, this it's now on the archive, um, is we detected carbon, partially forbidden carbon-3, the doublet here at a redshift of 7.7. .7. Unfortunately, you can see it's extremely faint. These are like five-hour integrations. If we could get the line ratio uh, more accurately, uh, we, could, uh, we could constrain the electron density. Uh, we see carbon-4. I have to explain this to you. The way uh, spectroscopy is done at these faint limits is we jitter. You know, we move the object up and down, and then we see that we confirm a, a signal. It's a very tentative detection of carbon-4. Uh, this is a doublet, this and this, the right separation. Ah, uh, yes, sorry. Wavelength is moving this way, spatial. Th these are skylines, yeah. Oh, that was bright enough that we didn't, you know, we dithered, but we, did, we, we combined them to see the both lines. But they are, you know, I have the, the equivalent plot for the other one. Yeah. Do please keep chipping in. You know. <laughs> um, this object is, is probably the most interesting because we have a very long exposure coming from the VLT, and I'm hoping that this will really clinch the contribution of AGN. So here's an object. This is a, a 7.15. We see carbon-4. We may see helium-2, which is a, which would be amazing. And very recently, uh, the Italian group, Pentarici et al., have used ALMA uh, to detect uh, C+. And so the combination of all these lines, if we can narrow it down, will help us determine whether these objects you know, can be explained. Let me go back to the relevant slide here. What we're let me just explain what we're trying to do with these lines is we're trying to measure these ratios, okay, so that we can determine whether you need a spectrum harder than hot stars to make a contribution to the ionizing output of these objects. Now, AGN, for some reason, oops, going backwards. Yes, for some reason. <coughs> This is a very Italian viewpoint. Um, and I don't know what it's got to do with Italy, but the idea seems to be that, you know, AGN, you know, are a very important contribution to reionization. And the idea uh, comes from uh, the UV luminosity function of AGN, particularly the faint end. We've known for many years there just aren't enough quasars to reionize the universe. The number is falling steeply as we go to high redshift. But what about an abundant population of low luminosity AGN. So in a, what I think I can safely say is a provocative article, Madow and Hart took the UV luminosity function of AGN, but then they made the bold assumption that all of the photons get out of the AGN, 100% escape of photons. And if they do that, they can make a significant contribution. Now, you know, I can imagine that for a quasar, 100% uh, of the light is coming from a non-thermal source. But as you go down to lower luminosities, it's reasonable to assume that some of, those UV, some of those UV photons are coming from stars. After all, AGN are in star-forming galaxies. So I think this is an extreme viewpoint that all of the UV radiation is non-thermal and all of it gets out to these low luminosities. Nonetheless, it's clear that AGN will make a contribution there are, they are definitely an extra source of ionizing photons. And so this balance in the hardness of the spectrum is very, very important. 
So let me, I'm probably running out of time, let me finish with this most vexing question of the fraction of photons that get out. So of course, uh, we need an escape fraction of greater than 10% um, to, to explain the uh, Planck optical depth. Um, it could be reduced a little bit if the spectrum of is harder, as, as seems to be the case. And it's turned out to be extremely difficult to observe. The theorists, uh, I remember giving a talk in Paris, where at this point, Jerry Ostreicher interrupted and said it was obvious didn't need any further discussion. It was obvious that at high redshift, the escape fraction in galaxies was much higher than at lower redshift. And I said, yes, but you know, I'm an observer. I have to verify that observation. I just can't take your word for it. Uh, but it's certainly true that simulations suggest that galaxies are more porous. Um, you know, what the radiation pressure, galaxies are physically smaller. They're forming stars. Uh, at a much higher specific star formation rate, so the radiation pressure blasts holes in the H2 regions, the ionizing photons can escape. So the question is, can we verify this uh, simple picture? And it's been hard work. Um, how do you measure the escape fraction? Well, you go to the Lyman limit, and you see whether there's any leakage. Okay, sounds simple, doesn't it? Okay. Um, and uh, you t or you take images below the Lyman limit with Hubble or from the ground. But it turns out that when people, and there are many groups doing this, a uh, 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 group at UC Riverside is particularly, Brian Shanner and his group particularly prominent in this, they're getting incredibly low escape fractions, zero to two or three percent or something. And the tragedy is we can't apply this direct technique uh, in the reionization era because all the opacity of the Lyman alpha forest along the line of sight uh, washes out and absorbs this signal. So we have to apply, look at direct methods. So um, Tucker Jones looked at the, um, pr as a proxy for the neutral gas, the covering fraction of low ionization gas looking at absorbing lines that are probably cool and therefore trace the neutral outflowing gas. So this is it's like having one minus the escape fraction or the covering fraction. And uh, this is a stack of spectra, redshift four, um, which has some indication that the covering fraction is getting less. Um, so when you look at here is the depth of the low ionization material at redshift three, 3.7 and and five or 4.5, um, but you know there are many critics of this method because you don't just look at the. It all depends on the kinematics of the gas, and it's, it turns out to be extremely, extremely messy. Um, so low redshift analogs may help. It may be that you know we can find low redshift systems that are very similar to the um, objects in the reionization, where we can study these parameters in detail. So what kind of objects uh, would be similar to uh, galaxies in the reionization era? Well, they'd have to have low metallicity because it's the early period of the universe. They have to have a high specific star formation rate. And I'm now going to come back to this issue, the intense oxygen-free emission. And it turns out that um, Nakajima, who's a, a, a very bright postdoc with me at ESO, uh, Kimihiko Nakajima, wrote a very nice paper with Masami Uchi looking at Lyman alpha emitters at redshift three. And um, it's a little complicated, but this is the ratio of oxygen three to oxygen two. And so the intense oxygen three emitters are up here. And you can see that the, their Lyman alpha galaxies uh, have a much higher oxygen three content uh, than the normal Lyman break galaxies at the same redshift. And they suggested that this is because their H2 regions, the gas is too, too compact to form a complete Stromgren sphere. So when we, you know, in, in, in graduate school, when we did the Stromgren sphere, we, we looked at ionization bound system. The radius of the object is determined by the ionizing radiation. And so we get shells at different ionization rates. So the O3 and the O2 will not occupy the same volume. But if the density, if the Nebula is density bound. It doesn't have, uh, doesn't completely form the Stromgren sphere. 
then they argued that this could explain this uh, intense oxygen-3 emission. I'm sorry? No. So, uh, what? So the, pardon? So it, it means it's too small. It doesn't, it's too compact. So it's a, their, this is their phrase, okay? So we basically uh, started looking at more of these objects uh, with MOS fire. And uh, so this is one of their Lyman alpha emitters. We know if you see oxygen three here, it's very intense. Uh, and so this is where we are at the moment. We just put this on the archive a couple of weeks ago. We now see over a much larger, vol much larger sample that uh, this indeed holds up. You can see the oxygen is oxygen three to oxygen two is very much higher than, than in Lyman break galaxies. This suggests that the, we also measure H beta. So this can be used as from the recombination method show that the spectrum of these objects is, is, is quite a lot harder. And we now have a Hubble program uh, to look at the escape fraction from these, these objects. And there's some evidence that these intense emitters do have a high escape fraction. So there are two examples, uh, Van Zeller et al. Uh, see, whoops, Van Zeller et al. see this uh, escape uh, in this object at redshift 3.2, they claim the escape fraction is extremely high. And Alice Shapley uh, likewise finds an object. Uh, and so it's very interesting to see whether this is a fundamental feature. I if oxygen-3 is uh, very, very strong because the star-forming regions you know, don't arrange themselves in the same way as an ionization me nebula, then their escape fraction may be high and their radiation field may be, may be uh, very hard. Let me finish. Uh, so we have the James Webb. We have, of course, the ground-based telescopes that we live in hope will, uh, will come. We have SKA. And uh, so James Webb. So, you know, the exciting thing with James Webb, especially with this shift down in redshift of the reionization era, all of these lines, including the optical lines and the rest UV lines that are currently beyond reach, uh, will be easily accessible. Um, so, you know, we won't have to rely on Spitzer photometry. We will see the, and measure these line strengths uh, directly. So it's not just composition. It's also, of course, the strength of these lines and their contribution as measurements of the ionizing spectrum. Um, these objects are physically very small. Um, and what's not often not understood is that James Webb will not have a higher um, spatial resolution than Hubble. And so paradoxically, um, you know, the ground-based telescopes with adaptive optics uh, will have better uh, angular resolution. Um, and so it's a reversal of what we generally, you know, we generally tend to think of Hubble taking the deep pictures, ground-based telescopes doing the spectra. You know, the demographics will be very different. We will be, of course, doing spectroscopy, uh, and particularly for this subject, we'll be doing spectroscopy because these lines are not accessible uh, from the ground. But imaging will be very important with the ground-based telescopes because they have this, um, they have this uh, improved uh, resolution through adaptive optics. Uh, I haven't talked about ALMA. Uh, it's slowly making its impact in this area. We, uh, there are two things maybe to say. One is dust. Uh, we haven't talked about dust. Dust, of course, aff greatly affects the analysis of the photometry. Uh, and of course, it can constrain chemical enrichment. We have one galaxy at a redshift of six, 7.6, which has uh, an ALMA continuum detection. These are the two lines I showed you, C plus, 158 microns. There's another one here, oxygen three. Uh, this is at a redshift of uh, 7.2 from this very nice paper by Inoue et al. These are very, very important constraints as well. Slow progress with ALMA, but I think now that it's fully up to speed, it's gonna be very exciting. So I promised um, challenges, and um, Scott said, you know, any talk that has challenges in means there's a lot more to do, uh, and it's certainly true. So let me just highlight some of the things. Is the low Planck tau correct? It's a huge importance in this field to bring reionization down into a narrow redshift range. That's very, very important. Uh, soon we'll see new constraints on reionization from Subaru. That's gonna be very exciting. Uh, I keep my ears to the ground in Munich uh, 
to try to understand what's happening with LOFAR. They keep saying they have a huge amount of data. They never seem to actually tell us uh, what's happening. So hopefully that'll be very exciting soon. Uh, we have these two measurements uh, that constrain the role of galaxies. We have the production rate of ionizing photons, psi ion. Uh, I think we have really good handle on these now. We can soon test for the contribution of AGN. And this is an area ripe for exploitation with James Webb. The biggest uh, bugbear is the escape fraction. And uh, there's no, no easy way to do this. We're not going to be able to measure it directly in the, in the reionization era. Uh, and so trying to understand whether these O3 emitters have some clue uh, in terms of uh, the structure of their ionizing regions may be the way forward. And then finally, dust at high redshift. Okay, thank you. No, um, you know, <laughs> time dilation is a big issue with supernova because, you know, you've got a survey for a very long time and, you know, they remain, you know, you know, dilated for a couple of years or so. So it would re require a very intensive campaign. So no, I, I'm not aware of any, you know, serious discussion of this with the current facility. No, I don't think so. No. Who's in charge? <laughs> yeah, so I think, you know, for looking at companions and structure, so it seems to me that many of these intense objects may be in dense regions. And so looking for the smaller objects nearby is something that AO would be very good at doing. And, you know, people are often surprised that James Webb, you know, after $8 billion, you know, it's the same, same, same resolution as Hubble. Yes. Yeah, the, the background is a limit. But if they're, com if they're sharp, if they're small and compact, then the contrast seems to be good enough, yeah, according to our simulation. Yes. 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 No. 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 So you're right that there's a danger of this approach of connecting it to reionization that we only look, we're only interested in the sources that are helpful for reionization. So that Planck, I was very surprised when I read the Planck paper that they were so confident in their statement that beyond a redshift of, I think it was beyond a redshift of 12 or 10, you know, there's, there's, there's probably not much action. That doesn't mean there aren't stars out there um, and galaxies. Spoken like a true uh, W map. <laughs> well, what I'm what, while you're here, what I wanted to know is how reliable is this kin kinetic SC effect? Because that is a that is a very uh, important argument in the delta Z. Good. Okay. Well, that's good news. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>